so excellent that you're all here in these in these uh, in these vast numbers uh, so late in this in this conference. Um, so let me start directly. Uh, change by service design, no way. Uh, I, I read the book, and you probably all read the book, uh, Change by Design, which is a good book. Um, but it made me think over the past five years, and, and I came to a conclusion, which I would like to share with you uh, today. But before I do so, short introduction on who I am. Um, my job is probably the most fantastic marketing job uh, there is in the uh, in the entire world. I get to combine these three disciplines uh, in three teams and under my responsibility within Delta Lloyd Group. So I'm responsible for customer experience management, trying to improve the customer experience. I'm responsible for the brands, uh, meaning two of our major B2C and business-to-business -business brands, Aura and Delta Lloyd. Uh, and I get to lead the customer intelligence or customer analytics team. So it's a opportunity to combine left brain, right brain, analytics, uh, uh, qualitative research, and, and whatever have you. So uh, I find myself really in a, in a lucky situation. My picture of quality of life. And I, I had to think about this for, for some time. There were also uh, competitors, like the after party pics from yesterday. Uh, those were uh, also quite interesting. Uh, and, I, and I thought about including some apps, because apps seem to uh, improve the quality of life uh, significantly uh, uh, lately, if I listen to it. But I chose this one, uh, because for me it envisions uh, um, my, my, well, positive feeling of getting into a new day every day. And it has been different, and I will get to, I will get to that uh, uh, shortly. So change, I think, is hardly ever designed consciously. I think service designers in general, and, and, and I'm not a designer, have this feeling that uh, uh, we can fix it. We can fix it with design. But change, and, I, and we've heard a lot about it today, uh, uh, seems to be something that's hardly to be fixed. Uh, and I do think it can be fixed, but it's not an easy uh, task, and definitely it's not something that can happen by design. Change just happens upon us. It happens overnight. And, and I thought, OK, how can I prove that? So I just listed a couple of things that changed in my environment over the past couple of months that really impact my capability or my ability to drive change. Uh, so change definitely is not something that I drive. It's something that I drive together with other people and that I'm dependent upon. Um, well, you can see there I made a promotion, which is good. Uh, but my boss is ill, so I'm also taking her job now. So that's two jobs in one, which is uh, uh, a challenge in time. Um, I finally hired this new consultant that I need, uh, which is good. But then there's also a new CEO, and you see within the company all people waiting. Oh, well, let's wait what he thinks. All things, very important things that, that really impact my ability to drive the change that I, uh, that I want. Uh, IT hired this new guy, good guy, by the way. Uh, so he's going to help me. Uh, and, and we have a challenge that a new product that we launched last year is not performing as well as we hoped. Uh, so we need to fix that uh, uh, too. So there's a lot of change going on. Um, and, and the problem is, we don't have the ability to see it coming. So we just have to embrace the change as it comes in and then try to deal with it. But that's not an easy task. So I think change is a result of bad or good luck uh, and a bit of chance. But I also uh, um, think there are about five strategies, five personal strategies, that you can apply to increase your chance, to increase the luck that you have uh, in getting this change uh, done. Uh, and this is as much a story about the change that I'm trying to drive at Delta Lloyd Group as it is a story about personal change, uh, about personal transformation that I think uh, is also part of that. Uh, part of that journey. My change entered the room in 2006. At that time, I didn't know it was a change that would transform the way I was working and transform the way uh, uh, I operate. But at that time, I was working for a large marketing services uh, outsourcing provider, and we did basically call centers, logistics, uh, all the stuff that uh, customers uh, really, uh, uh, really see. So, uh, dealing with a lot of touch points that are that are uh, that matter to customers. 
Um, and as I was responsible for the call center, the new CEO that came in said, hey, I want you to drive more profit. Uh, and I was, I was really working on improving the customer experience. Uh, and of course, I thought, hey, I can, I can convince him of doing the other way. Well, I was wrong. I didn't see it though until 2008, and then we were in this bad relationship that basically I got myself fired. <coughs> and of course, you don't put fired on your resume or on your LinkedIn profile. You said we had a difference of opinion or something, but basically this is what happened. Uh, so I didn't see and didn't recognize the impact of the change that I didn't make, uh, but that was just happening to me. So strategy number one, really make an effort to recognize the changes around you for what they are worth. There are changes that really are not that important, but there are changes that might seem unimportant, but they are really, really impactful. Um, and I think I made a mistake by not recognizing the change, and I probably uh, should have thought, okay, this is, not, this is not working, I should go find a new job or so. But I didn't, I pushed forward, uh, and I lost. So I took three months off, which is a good thing. I got a bit of money with me, so that was, uh, that was okay. But uh, actually, it looked more like this. I was, I was pretty much a bit depressed. Uh, I, I, I lost my job, I wanted to provide for my family, uh, um, and I really was looking for, okay, so, so where should I go? But after three months, I decided to pick up and, and go work for myself as a self-employed employee, because really, I didn't want to have a boss anymore. Uh, uh, once you had such an experience with a boss, you probably think, okay, let's go away with that for a while. So then I uh, started working, and, and Fred Simney, I think he's also in the room, is, is the first one. Uh, Fred, raise your hand. There he is. <laughs> Fred basically started the change of my life, because he said, Wim, uh, when he hired me, you should, you should go blog, and you should go tweet. I said, okay, well, sounds interesting, Fred, you remember. Uh, and uh, 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 that's basically what I did. I started blogging, and I started tweeting. Uh, and amazing things started to happen. All of a sudden, I was part of, uh, of several online communities uh, uh, in the area of social media, in the area of CRM, in the area of service design, uh, and all kinds of other disciplines, operational excellence. Um, and I was writing about my thoughts, and I was interacting with a lot of people. Uh, I was invited to, uh, to speak uh, on conferences. Uh, I was invited to teach on business schools. Uh, all those kind of amazing things happened, I think, because of what Fred said I should do. Start blogging and tweeting. In English, he said, by the way. Uh, not in Dutch, because then the audience is a lot smaller. Um, I think that was a wise thing. And what I picked up from that is that, that strategy number two is that you need to immerse yourself always if you want to be ahead of change or drive change, immerse yourself in multiple knowledge networks or knowledge flows, uh, as uh, John Hegel uh, uh, calls them. I think that is one of the personal, really transformational uh, things that happened, uh, that happened in my life. But then I had this problem. Because I was a self-employed consultant, and, and well, I know a lot of you are self-employed consultants, very happy, but it also made me a bit unhappy because I, I couldn't drive the change that I needed a bigger platform, so to say. I needed something bigger to work on uh, uh, than, than smaller projects or tasks that, uh, uh, that I could do as a self-employed uh, self consultant. Um, and then, by mere fortune, I could say, I entered the corporate world. I was offered an interim position at, uh, at Delta Lloyd Group. Uh, and fortunately, I met a boss there who's a really, really nice woman. Uh, and who has a very good vision, uh, because she designed the job I currently have. Uh, and she said, Wim, I want you to apply for this job uh, after three months of, of working there. Um, and of course, I was, I was in doubt. What should I do? Should I take it or should I not? Uh, how will it work out? I don't like bosses that much, but she was okay. Um, and then I just said, okay, let's 
grasp the opportunity. And I think that's strategy number three. Don't hesitate so much. Don't hold back because of some certainties that you think you currently have. Embrace opportunity when it knocks on your door. What's there to lose? Um, basically, one of the major things I also learned over the past years, I, I worked with my previous employer for eight to 10 years, and then you get this, oh, if I leave, what do I get? And if I leave, I lose all the rights that I've built. And, and th those are all false reasons to stay. I can, say, I can, I can assure you that. Um, so embrace opportunity when it knocks on your door and get at it. But then, when you're inside this mammoth tanker, uh, uh, awful things happen. Your peers, well, these are the three things I believe they, uh, they will probably say, not right in your face, but it's what they do. They don't believe you. They want you to mind your own business, so don't bother with theirs. Uh, and they want you to keep it short and simple. And I'm an analytical guy, I like to make things big, so that was a problem uh, for, me, uh, for me personally. Um, we don't believe you, mind your own business, and, and keep it short and simple. And I thought, okay, so how am I going to deal with this? Uh, and I think, really, it's good advice that they're giving you. So, mind your own business is what I did. Strategy number four. Mind your own business. And what did I do? I saved them a lot of money. So by looking in my own business, by looking in, in the tools that I had within my team, uh, I thought, okay, so how can I contribute to their goals? Not mine, but theirs. And how can I use the capabilities that I have within my team to help them uh, advance their goals and their strategies and their changes? Uh, uh, and of course, in the process, I also tried a little bit to uh, 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 move forward on my own uh, agenda. Uh, what I did, to be specific, I killed telemarketing and I killed our direct mail program. Uh, two uh, uh, really uh, old-fashioned marketing tactics, I think, that uh, uh, have little value for customers and basically also have little value for, uh, uh, for a company, but that is a side note. So I saved them a lot of money. And then I earned some credibility uh, and I started spending some of that money on uh, Silver Innovation. Eric uh, uh, Roskam Abing, you probably know him. Eric and I met uh, uh, in the beginning of 2009 uh, and I think he does an amazing, uh, uh, amazing job on driving insights that help, uh, or generating insights that help our company uh, uh, move forward and really improve the experiences that we have. Um, this is a project that we made large. So we made a project, I think, that, that several hundreds of our employees took part on this project because we wanted to engage all kinds of people, um, which was a good thing. But we also made a big mistake. I think we made a big mistake. We had ideation, of course, at the end of this Insight uh, project, uh, and, and we did a, a contest uh, on who should win. And of course, somebody won and was very happy, but the idea never got executed. Because, well, you have seen the, uh, uh, um, the organization chart with uh, uh, all the people that don't want change. That's exactly what happened. So we didn't cover our bases before, uh, and basically the idea got stuck, which is uh, bad if you want to drive change. So if you have a good idea and you ask people to move forward on the idea and they don't get to execute it, uh, that's really a bummer. So that set me back a bit, uh, and it took, uh, I think, uh, over a year before we, uh, before we could move forward. So again, uh, we move forward from a, a, a perspective. What you see, the percentages on the bottom line are the percentages of uh, how much impact is driven by that phase of the customer journey on, on our MPS scores. Uh, and, and as you can imagine, in insurances, the largest part is the, the damages, so claims, 37%. But to my surprise, the customer decision journey and the onboarding process was, was number two. Uh, so we decided to move forward uh, on, uh, on that one. But it took me, uh, it took me really over a year uh, before, we, uh, before we could advance on that. And then we were doing also great work, but in a smaller, in a smaller team. And then we just got lucky. Really, I got lucky, because what seemed to be the case, Google was researching the customer decision journey uh, in a very quantitative manner, 
uh, by actually measuring what people do uh, online and questioning what they don't do online. Uh, and this was released when, when we just finished our qualitative research. So that really contributed uh, to the credibility of, of our research. Uh, but it also uh, uh, um, made us see that, that what we saw in the qualitative research uh, was actually uh, uh, confirmed in this quantitative research by, uh, by Google. So that was, that was really, really just luck. Uh, because we could never have done uh, this kind of research ourselves. And Google was already working on that for a whole year, uh, gathering that data. So if we were to do that ourselves, uh, we would at least be uh, uh, another year further. So we really got lucky. Uh, but this really uh, contributed to uh, uh, the role we have within our company of uh, understanding what customers in this new world are doing. Uh, and as a result, uh, we see that there are initiatives all around. And I don't have to drive research anymore or the change anymore. There are initiatives all around. Uh, Eric is, is now uh, called by, by uh, one of our, or some of our employees, I mean, uh, to start projects uh, themselves. So I, I can really uh, take a step back. And that's, that's actually when I started thinking, hey, maybe we uh, have reached a tipping point. Uh, but I wasn't so sure yet, yeah, because I had seen before, like probably m many of you had seen before, uh, that if you had a good idea, and a, uh, you would create energy. But after some time, it would drip down because daily, uh, uh, daily problems take over. But um, what we did last year in December is uh, uh, conduct a survey among all our employees in the marketing department uh, to ask them, okay, what do you think that the core competencies of the marketeer of 2020 are going to be. Uh, where do you think you are on a scale on, uh, on those competencies? Uh, and what do you think you should be able to reach in a couple of years? Uh, and, and the results was amazing. Um, customer experience emerged as the number one expertise. And that really struck me as a surprise. But it did uh, confirmed to me that we had reached tipping points, that we now see that marketeers that are used to selling stuff are now interested in driving customer experience. And I think that's a very important uh, tipping point. And since then, we have educated 75, uh, almost 80 marketeers on the basics of, of customer experience management and service design. Uh, and we are now training uh, another two classes, so that's 30 people, as experts in uh, doing uh, service, design, uh, service design work aimed to improve our customer experience. Uh, so I'm really uh, quite confident that in a year or a couple of years from now, uh, I'm not the only one driving the change, but it's, it's the marketeers that really are working on getting the uh, customer experience improved. So that brings me to strategy number five, stick to your plan, I mean stick to your belief. Uh, because I got in, and of course I had an idea uh, of, of how to drive change, but it, it didn't work out as I thought up front. But by applying these five strategies, I think uh, now we finally uh, were able to actually create what we needed is a cultural change uh, so that we can drive customer experience forward over the next couple of years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wim. Right on time. Right on time. <laughs> Is there anybody that has a question? Or is there anybody that wants to say something? Build on something. Share something. Lovrens, hang on. Where is the Ah, here we go. Do you have a Yeah. Oh. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious when you're talking about service design and customer experience, because in some way they seem to be completely different communities. Yeah. Do you see it that way? Uh, I don't see them as separate communities. I, I'm just interested in um, driving results. Uh, so I use ideas from both communities, if you see it as, as communities, 
I, I think there's a big overlap in the communities anyway in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, that's what I see, and, and in my mind, that's, that's one thing. So I, I use it as one thing. Yeah, okay. answer. Yeah, uh, okay. I, I completely agree with you. Uh, but Good. my question is that sometimes I see a different community and they come from a completely different place. We're talking yep. about the same things, but in different places. Yeah, but that's also uh, a good thing, huh? because uh, combining ideas from, from people that come from different angles is, is good. I think that's also something that I, I personally enjoy because I've worked in operations, I've worked in marketing, uh, analytics. So uh, combining all these, these ideas is good. It's never just service design that drives something or, or customer experience that drives something. There's no superior thought. Uh, uh, really, there's, there's just all good ideas, and there's also bad ideas. Uh, but if you filter out the good ideas from all these different angles, you, you're probably able to, uh, to mash it up together and, and to see something good emerge. That's at least what, uh, what I'm trying to do, and that's also what I'm trying to teach, uh, uh, or teach. I'm trying to work with uh, in my team, uh, because they are different uh, breeds of people. Uh, uh, analytical people, those are the data scientists that like to really find the truth in the data. And then you have the, the brand people that really don't believe any data at all. Uh, so, uh, it's, uh, but it's good to see them work together and, and share ideas, although they have a completely different background. Okay, Jesse, you can have the pink one. I've also found myself in situations about teaching marketeers how to do service design, and I find there's a limit to which they can reach the skill. They may be creative, but you teach them a few methods, they get it. What do you see as something that they can transfer and stop just thinking, okay, we need to sell someone something? Uh, I think that's a manager's job. Uh, so, so we need to give them other goals. Uh, and that's, that's um, well, one of the things that we've also been doing within uh, the management team that I'm part of. Uh, and that doesn't go overnight. Uh, so it, that's something that takes a couple of years to convince higher management, because there's always somebody higher, uh, uh, that they need to, uh, need to change the metrics. Um, currently, we're not that far that, that we are leaving sales targets behind, of course. Uh, but we are uh, uh, putting customer experience targets uh, up more prominently. So I think that, but that's really, that's a job that managers need to do. Uh, and that's also, uh, understanding that, that's also why I really wanted this uh, when I said I needed a different platform. I needed to be on the manager's seat to be able to drive that change because everybody was telling me that, that wrong targets was driving wrong behavior. And I think that's, uh, uh, that's true. Okay, thank you very much. We're done. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs>